Good evening, everyone. It's 6.04. I call this meeting to order. Uh, we'll start with roll call. Alda Benavides, present. Anthony Oresti, present. Esmeralda Solis, present. Nereida Cantu, present. Mary Hernandez, present. Roberto Zamora, present. Alex Cantu, present. I do declare quorum, Dr. Sainz. Thank you, Mr. Cantu. Good evening, everyone. Today, we have a special student that's going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Her name is Bella Bustillos. Bella is a second grade student at Diaz Villarreal Elementary. How cute. She is an all A honor roll student, a GT student, and she is in the cheer squad. Her parents are Annette Lopez and Jose Bustillos. Can we please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. You did a great job, Bella. Thank you. Will Bella's parents and family please stand so that we can recognize you? Moving on, we're going to move uh, public comments to uh, after the superintendent's report. So with that being said, uh, item number uh, five is tax collector's report. And then item number one is approval of February 2023 tax collector's report. Need a motion? So moved. I have a motion by Ms. Solis. I need a second. Second. Second by Dr. Cantu. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Uh, item number six, approval of minutes. Number one, special call meeting, February 27th, 2023. Need an item to approve. Uh, motion to approve. So moved. I have a motion by Ms. Solis. I need a second. Second. Second by Mr. Oresti. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, motion carries. Uh, item two, regular call meeting uh, for March 8th, 2023. I need a motion. So moved. I have a motion by Mr. Oresti. Need a second? Second. Second by Ms. Solis. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Item, uh, moving on to number, uh, item number seven, superintendent's report. Thank you, Mr. Cantu. Before I begin the superintendent's report, I do want um, to make an announcement. And uh, with your permission, Mr. Board President, I would like to read my uh, retirement letter. I began my teaching career at Benavides Elementary, La Jolla ISD, as a kindergarten teacher. I never imagined that it would be the beginning of my great passion for teaching children and for education. As a graduate of La Jolla High School, and then a kindergarten teacher in my hometown of Sullivan City, I knew I would never leave La Jolla ISD to work anywhere else. The next 36 years flew by, and it has been the highest privilege to have served our students and community. After 36 amazing years, I am announcing my retirement effective June 27, 2023. My career has been a blessing in so many ways. Many of my kindergarten students are now district employees and I'm so proud that they serve our students in many capacities. Teachers I worked with as a principal are now leaders in the district, and their commitment to educational excellence is to be commended. As an assistant superintendent, I worked with incredible directors, coordinators, and staff that work tirelessly supporting teachers and principals so that every student had the most amazing lessons all the time. Let me see. I have been blessed to work with incredible central administration leaders and staff that do all they can each day to provide clean, attractive, and safe schools, to transport students, to serve nutritious meals, to provide the most innovative supports and resources for our students, 
and to spotlight their achievements. I would like to thank every single staff member for everything you do every day to make students shine bright. I would also like to thank the superintendent's cabinet, past and present, for their outstanding leadership and their determination to make difficult but needed decisions for our students. I must also thank the parents and community of La Jolla ISD for the unending support they have given me throughout my 36 years. Thank you also to La Jolla ISD Board of Trustees, past and present, for the opportunity to serve as Superintendent of Schools. It has been an honor to lead such an amazing school district. La Jolla ISD afforded me many learning experiences, but most importantly, I had the great pleasure of working and learning from many great people whose influence made me a better teacher, leader, friend, wife, mother, and woman. I will greatly miss La Jolla ISD. I wish all students, teachers, administrators, and support staff many wonderful successes. May La Jolla ISD always be a leader in educational excellence. I would like to add that as of now, as of the end of the 21-22 school year, the academic accountability rating for La Jolla ISD is an 88, and the district's financial report, which is the Financial Integrity Rating System of Texas, it is the district's financial management report. It's a 98 out of 100 points. And this is due to the hard work of our students, of our staff at our campuses and central office, the work of our parents, and the work of our board of trustees. Thank you all so much. everyone. Uh, I'd like to read also a statement that, that we prepared. Uh, as a board president of La Jolla ISD, I am proud to formally announce that the board of trustees has accepted the retirement of our esteemed superintendent, Dr. Isela Sainz. We extend our deepest appreciation for her years of exceptional service and unwavering commitment to our district for more than two decades. Dr. Sainz's journey began in a classroom teacher, and she went to serve in various administrative roles, including instructional supervisor and a school principal and an assistant superintendent before being appointed as a superintendent in 2019. Throughout her tenure, Dr. Sainz has remained dedicated to the continuous improvement of La Jolla ISD and the growth of the well-being of each student. During unprecedented challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Sainz demonstrated outstanding leadership, prior prioritizing the safety and well-being of her students, staff, and our entire community. She swiftly adapted to the rapid changes uh, and circumstances, implementing innovative remote learning strategies and providing essential resources. Uh, resources. Her commitment to maintaining educational continuity and for fostering unity proven crucial to La Jolla ISD resilience and success during these extraordinary times. On behalf of La Jolla ISD Board of Trustees, we express our profound appreciation for Dr. Gisela Sainz's remar remarkable service to our district, her leadership, passion for education, and unwavering dedication to the positively, positively impacted the lives of countless students and staff members. As we navigate through here, our commitment to success to our students and the future of La Jolla ISD remains unwavering. And in closing, please join me and La Jolla ISD Board of Trustees uh, to wish Dr. Gisela Sainz a well-deserved retirement and continued success in her future endeavors. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Castillo. Thank you, Board of Trustees. Moving on to, uh, we're still on the superintendent's, superintendent's report. report. So I will now do the enrollment report that is dated April 4th, 2023. 
On this day, we had 11,835 elementary students, 12,998 secondary students, for a total of 24,833 students, which is 258 more than at this time last year. For the uh, first recognition, if I could have Mr. Cantu, Mr. Anthony Uresti, and Dr. Uh, Nereida Cantu move forward so that we can begin our recognitions. And we'll begin with recognition of the instructional assistance in recognition of National Paraprofessional Appreciation Day. Dr. Marta Villarreal, our Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources, will do the recognition. Thank you, Dr. Villarreal. Good afternoon, Board President, Board of Trustees, Dr. Science, La Jolla ISD community. I am privileged to be recognizing our Instructional Assistants of the Year for the 22-23 school year in honor of the National Paraprofessional Appreciation Day. Paraprofessional Appreciation Day is observed annually on the first Wednesday of April and honors educators as teacher aides and instructional assistants. Paraprofessionals often provide teachers with administrative support, work with students outside of the classroom, and provide one-on-one -on -one support for students who have disabilities or special educational needs. Today, let us take the time to recognize the vital work paraprofessionals do and thank them for their contribution. Let's go ahead and get started with, from Benavides Elementary, we do have Mr. Ivan Garza. From Chapa Elementary, we have Mr. George Luis Flores, Jr. From Diaz Villarreal Elementary, we have Mr. Omar Ortega. From Fordyce Elementary, we have Ms. Jasmine Cortina. From JFK Kennedy Elementary, we have Jose Jaime Casineda. From Mendiola Elementary, we have Mr. Javier Cisneros, Jr. From Perez Elementary, we have Ms. Gladys Edith Martinez. From Reina Elementary, we have Ms. Leticia Peña. From Seguin Elementary, we have Ms. Giselle Marie Cuevas. From Tabasco Elementary, we have Ms. Maria A. Ruiz. From Chavez Middle School, we have Ms. Aria Erith Olivares. From Richards Middle School, we have Natalie Campion. From Juarez Lincoln High School, we have Ms. Amy Mendoza. And from La Jolla High School, we have Ms. Eileen Rodriguez. Eliana Rodriguez. So let's go ahead and give them another round of applause. Thank you so much for everything that you do every single day. You are here representing the rest of the paraprofessionals in our district. So thank you so much. Congratulations Once again, thank you. Instructional assistance. Thank you so much for all your work.
Next, we have recognition of La Jolla ISD Assistant Principals in recognition of National Assistant Principals Week. Good, good afternoon, Mr. Board President, Madam Superintendent, ladies and gentlemen of the board and community. Uh, this week, or this past week, was National Assistant Principals Week. It's celebrated during the week of April the 3rd through the 7th. And it is a celebration of the unsung heroes in our educational system, our assistant principals. These dedicated folks work tirelessly to bolster teachers, motivate students, support their principal, create a positive learning community, and face the many unpredictable challenges that land on their desks. Assistant principals play, play a crucial role, and that week was dedicated, uh, we dedicated some time to recognize them for their hard work and commitment to our schools, students, and profession. So this evening, we would like to begin by recognizing our La Jolla High School assistant principals, uh, starting with Mr. Brian Canales. Mr. Ruben Salazar. Ms. Maria Rios. Ms. Rebecca Guzman. Ms. Clarissa Rios. Mr. Albert Sandoval, Ms. Norma Quintanilla, and also joining them, uh, our uh, La Jolla High School principal, Mr. Antonio Cano. Big thank you to our La Jolla High School assistant principals. We will now uh, recognize our Juarez Lincoln High School assistant principals, and we will begin with Ms. Laura Cantu. Mr. Lionel Peña. Mr. Gilbert Casanova. Mr. Eduardo Flores. Mr. Everardo Chapa. Mr. Jose Peña. And Dr. Santos Palomo. Mr. Luis Garcia. And joining our La Juarez Lincoln uh, assistant principals is our pr uh, principal, Mr. Ricardo Estrada. A big thank you to our White Link and Assistant Principals. We will now recognize your Palm View High School assistant principals, and we'll begin with Mr. Ciro Gonzalez. Ms. Elba Campos. Mr. Esnel Cantu. Mr. Juan Flores. Ms. Lisa Cano. Ms. Edna Garcia, Mr. Luis Bocanegra. And joining our Palmview High School assistant principals is our Palmview High School principal, 
Mr. Leonel Perez. A big thank you to our Palm View High School assistant principals. <laughs> Joining us as, uh, this evening as well is Ms. Uh, Liana Garcia, assistant principal at the Academy of Health Science Professions in STEM. <laughs> And uh, she's joined by her principal, Ms. Leanne Herrera Lanis. Big thank you to Ms. Fabiana Garcia. Moving on to our middle schools. From Cesar Chavez Middle School, we have Ms. Diana Alvarez. Now from Domingo, Domingo Treviño Middle School, we do have uh, our assistant principal, Ms. Rosa Guajardo, and Ms. Cynthia Salinas, and joined by her principal, Ms. Annette Lozano. <laughs> We will now recognize our elementary assistant principals, and we will begin with Ms. Joanne Zamora from JFK Elementary, accompanied by her principal, Ms. Mary Guerra. From Benavides Elementary, we do have Mr. Dolores Araujo, assistant principal at Benavides Elementary. <laughs> From Ibi Rain Elementary, we will uh, go ahead and call the, the rest of the assistant, assistant principals. They can take a group picture together. From E.B. Reina Elementary, we do have Ms. Graciela Alaniz, accompanied by her principal, Ms. Lucy Linda Garza. From Ms. Candon Elementary, we have Ms. Irma Ramirez. From Diaz Villarreal Elementary, we have Ms. Vanessa Martinez. From Cavazos Elementary, we have Ms. Laura Solis. From Tabasco Elementary, we have Ms. Vilma Brantley. From Gonzalez Elementary, we have Ms. Ana Perez. Benson Elementary, we have Ms. Julissa Garza. From Zapata Elementary, we have Mr. Javier Hernandez. From Camarena Elementary, we have Ms. Ivani Rosales. From Paredes Elementary, we have Ms. Tanya Vasquez. And from Garza Elementary, we have Ms. Aide Hinojosa. Thank 
So a big thank you to our elementary assistant principals for all they do. <laughs> work your way in, work your way in. <laughs> Recognition of La Jolla ISD Library Staff. Uh, good afternoon again. Uh, this evening we're going to be recognizing our La Jolla ISD Library Staff. Uh, so National School Librarian Week is observed internationally, the week in which April the 4th falls. Uh, the week is observed to recognize the professionals that foster in our students a love for reading, and then ensure that our students have access to instructional uh, resources. In our district, that is done by our librarians, reader renaissance coaches, library clerks. These employees play a crucial role, and this week is dedicated, is a, is dedicated to recognize them for their hard work and commitment to our schools, students, and community. So we would like to recognize... Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Is that Somebody say something? No. I don't know. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry, Mr. Kuhn. No, no, it's okay. So we will begin by recognizing our uh, library staff. Um, and we will begin by recognizing Ms. Camille Villegas, librarian at Dr. Américo Paredes Elementary. I was admiring our little young photographer. She's so cute. From Dr. Uh, Dr. Palmira Mendio Elementary, our librarian, Ms. Maria Tristan. <laughs> From Emiliano Zapata Elementary, we have Ms. Sandra Lumbreras Library. <laughs> From John F. Kennedy Elementary, we have Ms. Rita Science uh, Library. <laughs> From Escandon Elementary, we have Ms. Flor Alaniz, librarian. From Irene Garcia Middle School, we have Ms. Sandra Chapa, librarian. And we would also like to recognize our central office uh, library staff, beginning with Ms. Maria Quintos. She is our Reading Renaissance Coordinator. And our Director of Library Services and Instructional Resources, Ms. Alma Salinas. and Dr. Cantu. And now if I could please have Dr. Zamora, Ms. Esmeralda Solis, Ms. Mary Hernandez, and Dr. Benavides step forward for the rest of our recognitions. go on with recognition of the boys and girls regional and state power lifting, power lifters, excuse me, from La Jolla High School, Juarez Lincoln High School, and Palmview High School. 
Mr. President, uh, Madam Superintendent, Board of Trustees, Administration and Community, it gives me great pleasure again to come and present these student athletes that continue to excel in the classroom and more importantly at the local level, at the regional level, and shining bright at the state level. Today we have from La Jolla High School, power lifter Gabriela Flores. She is a senior. She was fifth place in district, fifth place in regionals. Senior Gabriela Flores. Regional qualifier, a sophomore, Jocelyn Salinas. Not present today, not only because she takes care of her academics, she had to take care of her um, athletic uh, responsibilities, but having to take care of the family, she is working. The state champion at 132 pounds, Kaylee Guzman, I did want to verbally uh, acknowledge her for her state championship uh, uh, that she won up at the, um, ab in Frisco, Texas. Their coach is Coach Andres Gonzalez. And he's assisted by Coach Georgiana Rios Cabrera. High school principal, Mr. Antonio Cano. While Mr. Cano comes, we also want to acknowledge and recognize our La Jolla Early College Domingo Villarreal principal, Ms. Liana Laniz Herrera, Ms. Claudia Perez, Mr. Victor Rodriguez, um, for being a part of these student athletes because some of these students go to those academies and they work hand in hand with each other to allow them the opportunity to participate and make up their um, work as they need to to become and be eligible. We thank those principals for their uh, work and their collaboration that they do with us. If the parents of our regional and state power lifters are in the audience, please stand so we can recognize you. Congratulations. We'll now go on to recognition of the La Jolla ISD Weight Loss Challenge winners. Oh, one more. I'm sorry. Don't, I'm so, I apologize. We're good. Dr. Sines, we also want to present to you from Palmview High School. We have a senior at a 148 weight division, first place in district, first place in regionals, and your state champion, Crystal Montoya. If I may, I'd like to recognize the student also that's not able to attend. She is a junior, first place in district, and first state in, in, at state. The state champion, Julie Tomez, was unable to, to attend with us. But we do have a first place in district, first place in regionals, and silver medalist will be back with us next year as a junior. She is at 105 pounds, Dinora Galvan. Also a young man participating in a track and field today, Ray Pesina, was a district champion, regional champion, state qualifier. They are coached by Coach Renzo Tamez. As a team, as a team, they came out third at state. So congratulations to Coach Tamez and their, their team as they participated in this year's powerlifting state competition. Their principal. Their principal, Mr. Leonel Perez. Juarez Lincoln principal, Mr. Ricardo Estrada. If the parents of these uh, regional and state winners are in the audience, please stand so that we can recognize you. Mm -hmm. 
He's next. Now we're ready for recognition of the La Jolla ISD. Do you have others? Yes, the weight loss. Okay. Recognition of the La Jolla ISD weight loss challenge winners. Yes, as we continue our, our um, employee wellness uh, activities that go on, we started a weight loss program early January, and um, we had about 60, 64 participants that continued from the start to the end, and with that, we did go with BMI loss and not weight loss and not percentage loss. So it makes it a little bit different and makes it a little bit more of a fair um, um, across the board. So. We'll start first with first place from Tabasco Elementary with a, with a BMI, BMI loss of 4.5. The first place winner, Ms. Paula Olivo. From Paredes Elementary in second place, 0.2 behind her at 4.3, Dr. Erica Gonzalez. At third place, a point one behind her, America. but still working hard and continuing to do a great job from Gonzalez Elementary, Ms. Yesenia Campos. <laughs> These participants did win a monetary amount of $300, $150, and $75 for their participation and coming up on the top for those six to seven week period that we had the competition. We want to thank you for your participation and encourage everyone to participate next year. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. We'll go on to recognition of the La Jolla ISD Teacher Incentive Allotment Committee members. Good afternoon, Board President, Board of Trustees, Dr. Science, and La Jolla ISD community. I am pleased to be before you recognizing our Teacher Incentive Allotment Committee members for the 22-23 school year. I've worked side by side this team of outstanding staff members as we have increased our knowledge reviewed our system, made recommendations, and have had conversations regarding the important decisions that, are, that have allowed our district to identify and designate highly effective teachers using multiple data points. As a committee, we will continue to work collaboratively to advise and make the necessary adjustments to reward teachers by utilizing the teacher incentive allotment local designation system at La Jolla ISD. Today, we would like to take the time to recognize the vital work the staff members do and thank them for their contribution. From CHOP Elementary, we have Ms. Veronica Minton. From Diaz uh, Villarreal Elementary, we have Ms. Alicia Hernandez. From Garza Elementary, we have Mr. Daniel Flores. From Gonzalez Elementary, we have Ms. Marisol Peña. From JFK Elementary, we have Ms. Mary Guerra. From Mendiola Elementary, we have Ms. Carla Garza. From Paderes Elementary, we have uh, Dr. Erica Gonzalez. From Paderes Elementary, we have Mr. David Guerra. From Reina Elementary, we have Ms. Uh, Lucina Ga uh, Garza. From Seguin Elementary, we have Mr. Caranza. From Seguin Elementary, we have 
We, I'm sorry, from Tabasco Elementary, we have Mr. Ms. Rebecca Garcia. From Ibirreina Elementary, we have Ms. Sonia Gutierrez. From Head Start, we have Ms. Isabel uh, Gomez. From De Zavala Elementary, we have Ms. Sylvia Canales. From Ann Richards Middle School, we have Mr. Lumbreras. From Dr. Science Middle School, we have Ms. I'm sorry, from uh, Salinas Middle School, we have Ms. Nidia Ortiz. From Salinas Middle School, we have Ms. Cora Chavez. From Hope Academy, we have Mr. Cortez. From La Jolla High School, we have Mr. Cano. From La Jolla Early High School, we have Ms. Gonzalez. From Juarez High School, we have Ms. Reyes. From Jimmy Carter Early College High School, we have Ms. Gomez. And from, uh, Ms., uh, from Jimmy Carter Early College High School, we have Ms. Brown. So uh, we want to thank this committee because, like I said earlier, we have been working diligently making important decisions for our district. We want to thank each and every one of you for everything that you've done up to now. And once again, we will continue to work collaboratively to uh, assist our district with the teacher incentive allotment. And again, thank you so much for your contributions. Thank you. all so much for your hard work. Next we have information on requests for proposals, RFPs, awarded by the superintendent as per CH local policy. This information item is being provided in accordance to CH local policy. On September 28, 2022, our school board of trustees approved revisions to the corrective action plan to improve procedures regarding purchasing and acquisition. This action was necessary to promote efficiency with the ordering process. The RFPs herein have undergone procurement requirements, including evaluation by a, by a procurement evaluation committee, utilizing the respective evaluation matrix criteria. The RFP document, documentation includes a rationale and evaluation matrix detailing specific information related to the RFPs. And the specific RFPs are Consultant Services, RFP number 2023-14, Dimension Lumber, Hardware and Related Supplies, RFP number 2023-27, Awards and Incentives RFP, number 2023-44. Approval of Educational Materials and Equipment. Food and Paper Goods RFP, number 2023-59. And Fine Arts Performance Groups RFP, number 2023-63. Thank you. This concludes the Superintendent's Report, Mr. Mr. Sainz, may I ask a question? Yes, of course. On page 55, man. and I think it's similar for all of the different items here that you have. But in this particular one, you have the one, and, and I see it in the other items too, where there's reference made to prior year's proposals. Just to satisfy, I guess, my curiosity, why is it that we are 
linking them to prior years. Because it says it goes back to 2020, 2021, 2022, uh -huh. and then goes all the way through 2025. Yes. $15 million per year. Yes, that is the one on uh, approval of educational materials and equipment number 2023-56. Ms. Zapata is here to respond to your question, Dr. Samara. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Samara, good afternoon. Uh, school board, Dr. Science. Um, Dr. Samana, help me understand your question. Is your question um, in regards to um, the various RFPs being mentioned or the estimated cost? The various RFPs, particularly those, for example, the 2021-10, okay. the 2021-61, the 2021-61. Yes. Okay, so um, the way these RFPs are tailored is that we process them for a period of three years, the current year and two additional years. And we have language in our RFP solicitation that allows for supplemental RFPs to be processed for these types of uh, items. So sometimes um, there are new products that become available or new vendors that are in the market. And so we extend an opportunity for our district staff to let us know um, if the vendor list that we have is sufficient to meet district's needs. Sometimes there are new items, as I mentioned, that may not have been um, available through the list of the previously awarded vendors. For that reason, we include verbiage that allows us to supplement. That's why you see a list of several RFPs. And that amount is the estimated amount. Um, this is not extra funding that we are coming before our school board to ask for. These uh, funds would already be part of the current 2022-2023 school year budget. Okay, and so you have $15 million per year beginning in 2020, and this one is extended through 2025. So we're committing then from 23, 24, 24, 25, and also $15 million. We are not committing, that is only an estimate. We have language in our solicitations that indicate that purchases will be made contingent upon need and funding. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Thank you, Ms. Zapata. Thank you, Dr. Zamora. Uh, with that being said, we're going to move up back to item number four, public comments. Our first public comment is from um, Andres Lopez. Good evening, board members. Superintendent of Schools, before I begin, I would like to ask for an additional two minutes. I uh, extended on my time for a total of five minutes. I'm not sure if that's you okay. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, thank you. Esteemed members of the board and superintendent of schools, Dr. Science, good evening. My name is Andres J. Lopez, and I'm a proud teacher for La Jolla ISD. I've been with the district for 17 years, and I teach at Thelma Salina STEM Early College High School, and I'm here representing over 50 colleagues from the early colleges and AHSP STEM. Like many of my colleagues, I've earned an advanced degree. Mine happens to be in educational leadership and in piano performance. And like my colleagues, we use our education to provide the best possible experience to our students at La Jolla ISD. Unfortunately, as many of you know, we are not all compensated equally. In our district, teachers with a master's degree at our comprehensive high schools receive $4,000 stipend, while those at the specialized schools, like the ones we're at, receive only a quarter of that stipend. For the past five years, teachers and principals alike have raised the issue, and despite also raising the issue in various forums, such as the DEIC and high school teacher forums, and through representatives, from ATPE and AFT, we have yet to see any progress on the matter, and this has led us to present our case to you 
the board, the voice of our community, and the advocates for your people and teachers and schools. We prepared a couple of points that we would like to get into the record because there's so many things that have been said around this issue over the last five years. Our first point, one of the things that we've been told is that the intent of the difference in the stipends is, to off or is for teacher retention and recruiting. Well, our specialized schools suffer the same problem filling vacancies as the comprehensive high schools. And in fact, we're missing English teachers as in the case of La Jolla Early College, a chemistry teacher at Carter, as the vacancy has remained unfilled for two years. And this poses as significant a challenge as it would pose to the comprehensive high schools. Our students are just as adversely impacted by the same things that affect the comprehensive high schools. Point two, many teachers at the traditional high schools who have their masters are unwilling to transfer or apply due to substantial reduction in pay, causing possible issues with the quality of instruction provided to our students. And in fact, some teachers from the early colleges have left the early colleges because of that reason. Our third point, We've been told that the students at our specialized schools are somehow less of a challenge to work with than those at the comprehensive high schools. This is categorically untrue. TEA requires early colleges to match the district demographics for at-risk, economically disadvantaged, emergent bilingual students, and some of our campuses have more students in these subgroups. Our point four, the argument that teachers are dual enrollment and so receive an additional stipend from STC is moot because there are teachers also at the comprehensive high school who receive both the elevated master stipend and the dual enrollment stipend. And in fact, we have some teachers here this evening who teach no dual enrollment courses and receive only the $1,000 stipend at the early colleges. And not every teacher for the dual enrollment teaches a full course load of dual enrollment. So they're at a disadvantage. Our point five, the, miscon the misconception that things are easier for us is also very, very incorrect. Many teachers have to up to five different course types within their full six class load throughout the day, both dual and high school, without additional preparational time or compensation. And aside from instructional requirements, we also share the burden of mental and social emotional support for our students. We fulfill multiple roles, as you well know and have recognized in the past. Point six, instructors who have pursued advanced degrees have done so for a variety of reasons, and we can assure you, especially in education, that money is not at the top of the list. We all sought and seek to provide our students with quality educational opportunities and experiences, and we know that La Jolla ISD understands the value of having master teachers to teach our students. And because of this, the issue becomes one of equitability for our students. Consider this, we ask. It's not about what's being withheld from some of our teachers, but it's what's being held from some of the students because this disincentive, and that's what it is, could impact the quality of education in the long run for our specialized schools. We recognize there are financial concerns. We know the times we're living in, but here are the facts about the savings that we provide for our district. An employee of the district teaching dual enrollment courses is paid a $1,000 stipend for their master's degree regardless of the course load, while the campuses pay $6,000 per section for an instructor from STC. Even if we were getting paid the $4,000 stipend, as are the other teachers, it is still a considerable savings for the district. So to conclude, we respectfully request from you, board, that our compensation be aligned with our colleagues at the comprehensive high schools. We serve the same district. We have the same qualifications and the same responsibilities. And we're loyal. We're still here. We thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Sabrina. The next public comment is Hiram Gutierrez. Good evening, Dr. Sainz, President Cantu, and honorable members of the board. My name is Iram Gutierrez. I'm a partner with Purdue Brandon Fielder Collins & Mott, your delinquent tax firm. 
We are currently in our 14th month of a 36 month contract and I am very proud to announce that your delinquent tax collections are at an all time high. For the first eight months of this fiscal year, your collections are at 23.13, which is an improvement of 0.75% over the last year. I also want to point out, and I, there's a, a handout that we, we gave you, that is even a higher collection rate than McAllen ISD, an entity that usually has collection rates of over 5 to 12% points higher than La Jolla ISD. Your delinquent tax collections have never been in greater shape. We achieved the success by working closely with your taxpayers, treating them with honesty and integrity, and treating them, treating them like if they were one of our family members. We are also very, very proud to announce that recently, while your previous firm signed off on an agreed order that would have released over a quarter of a million dollars to a lawyer, money that belonged to La Jolla ISD and other entities, we were able to intervene. And eventually, that attorney did not get his money, that money, that money that belonged to the school district. The school district received over $123,000, money that I need, know that the school district really needed. I know we contacted Mr. Garza and told him, hey, this money's coming. It's coming from the district clerk. And he said, boy, this is a godsend. We just had some damage to some athletic equipment and this is going to go a long way to replace it. We look forward to working closely with you, working with the school district. We hope to continue working towards the end of our term and hopefully beyond. We thank you for your time and we look forward to working with you. La Jolla ISD's collection program has never been in better shape. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next public comment is from Michael Connell. Good evening, Dr. Sines, uh, Mr. Cantu, and members of the board. My name is Michael Cano, and I'm an attorney and a partner with Limebarger, the other law firm that was uh, just mentioned by the previous speaker. And I'm no stranger to this district. I've actually been working with Limebarger for about 13 years now. And our, our firm has been here in the Valley for about 40 years. And for most of those 40 years, we've actually represented La Jolla ISD. Um, and we represented La Jolla ISD up until 2017. And during that time, even though we no longer collect for the district, for La Jolla, I want you to know that we collect for over 90% of the school districts in Hidalgo County, from big, from large to small. We collect for over 90% of all other tax entities, cities, including the largest Hidalgo County. And that's important so you understand that even though I do not collect for La Jolla ISD, every day I deal with every one of your taxpayers because if they are delinquent with La Jolla ISD, they're delinquent with Hidalgo County, South Texas ISD, South Texas College, and everybody else. So even though I quit working for La Jolla back in 2017 when this district made a, a choice to go elsewhere, since then I have still been working for La Jolla ISD to do all the other accounts. But I still work with your taxpayers, make no mistake about it. And the reason why I say that is because I still have a professional relationship with every one of your taxpayers, and more importantly, I have an ethical obligation to every one of your taxpayers. So the other firm mentioned having better collections than McAllen ISD. I'll tell you, I represent McAllen ISD and nothing could be further from the truth. And I will challenge him to provide the document he is using, comparing apples to apples to actually sub, sub, you know, substantiate what he's saying. So now I want to talk about this matter, the Ocor, what we call the Bautista matter. Back in December of 2021, we had a very unique situation and then an attorney from Houston came down here. Excess proceeds, just we're all on the same page, is when we conduct a, a tax foreclosure, we obviously, the sale of the tax foreclosure, we pay with the proceeds of that sale, we pay all the outstanding taxes. If there's any money left over, we deposit it with, a, with Laura Hinojosa, our district clerk. She holds that money, okay, and she's responsible for that money. And if no one claims it after two years, if the statute is properly followed, then that money can come back to the district and all the other tax and entities. Well, in this case, in the Bautista matter, this was a sale that your delinquent tax firm, Purdue, actually conducted. 
and they had $320,000 left over. And they deposited that $320,000 seven years ago. And they sat on it, or it sat there in the district clerk's office. So now fast forward to December 2021, we get this lawyer by the name of Steve Okoruha, a lawyer from Houston, and he comes in on one day, December the 30th of 2021, and he files eight petitions to withdraw excess proceeds in eight different cases around Hidalgo County. And, and eight of those were, he was, in, in total, was about $143,000. Three of those belong to clients of the other firm, one here in La Jolla, one in Wesco, one in Mercedes, and then the other five belong to clients that I represent, Edinburgh, McAllen, and whatnot. In all eight of those cases, no one filed an objection, not even the other firm, and neither did my firm, because we all believed that the attorney who filed these documents was doing the right thing, because that's what we do as lawyers. And more importantly, all eight judges in those eight cases signed the orders to give that attorney the money. So that's in December 2021. Well, after he walked away with $150,000, he came back in May of 2022, just this last year, and he filed three more petitions. One included was about the Easter matter, which was, you know, at that time there was no longer 320,000. There was about $230,000 left in the registry of the court. The other firm, your firm that represents you, got at the minimum four notices, four notices from the court or from the lawyer, definitely from the district clerk's office, alerting them that that, that man was trying to take you know, the $234,000. And no objection was filed from those notices all the way up to the first hearing. The very first hearing, and at the very first hearing we had with Judge Rose Garrena, she asked, you know, there was some confusion. At that point, like I said, no one had filed any objection or any, any kind of challenge to this man taking the money. So the, the court asked for the lawyers to brief her. So we submitted briefs. The other firm filed an objection. We filed an objection. But let me tell you the most important part. From May 18th of 2022, until this case was actually heard December the 9th of 2022, your firm, or your, the lawyer representing your this district, filed these documents. This, this is the entirety. There's two documents. One's called an objection, a written objection. The other one's a brief, which is really the objection copied again. Almost out this, of time, Mr. Cook. Okay. This is what we filed. We litigated this case for at least 500, I spent at least 500 hours on this case. And I'll tell you that the other firm, I challenged the firm to bring anything other than these two documents. They never got a ruling on their objection. I actually investigated this individual, and what turned out is the judge ruled in our favor on my motion that does not have the other firm involved at all. Mr. Gutierrez showed up at the hearing and did not ask a single question. Instead, he had his associate attorney, who had been on the job a few months, stand in on this very important case, and she did not ask a single question of this lawyer who we now know was committing a crime. Since then, obviously, we got the money as a result of my order. That's my name on it, not Mr. Gutierrez. We got that money back for La Jolla, and I'm very proud of that. But we didn't stop there. I filed a grievance with the state bar. Got time, Mr. Cano. If, if I, can, I, can I just have 30 more seconds to wrap up? 30 seconds. I filed a grievance with the state bar. That lawyer's probably going to be disbarred. We met with the, the, the DA's office, and that case was actually referred to the federal authorities because it turns out that it's a, a nationwide scam. So we are now working with the federal authorities. And I went before the Yellow County Board of Judges and we now passed a new local rule. Lawyers practicing law in this county now have to follow a new rule which requires an affidavit to be submitted with the application. No other county in the state of Texas has that. We're the only ones. And when we had that passed, the other firm could have shown up and shown some support. They haven't done anything. So yes, the other firm filed an objection. This is what it was. Thank you. There's no additional public comments, Mr. Fenton. Thank you. Moving on to item number eight, discussion items. One, discussion of fourth six weeks average daily attendance for the 2022-2023 school year.
I'm sorry, I'm looking for my board PowerPoint and I don't see, oh, here it is. I apologize. Good evening, Mr. President, members of the board, Dr. Signs in our community. My name is Ivana Ayala, Assistant Superintendent for Student Services, and I'm here to share with you the four six weeks attendance rate for La Jolla ISD. Beginning with our high schools, the average daily attendance for the four six weeks for all campuses was 85.98%. I like to highlight Juarez Lincoln High School with the highest average of 86.93% for the six weeks. From our specialty schools, the attendance average was at 73.30%. I'd like to highlight um, College and Career Center with the attendance average of 83.59% for the four six weeks. From our early college high schools, their average daily attendance was at 95.44%. I'd like to highlight La Jolla Early College High School with a four six weeks attendance rate of 97.26%. From our middle schools, their daily average was at 94.15% for the six weeks. I'd like to highlight Memorial Middle School with the attendance average of 95.69% for the four six weeks. And from our elementary schools, their average daily attendance was at 94.35% for the four six weeks. And I would like to highlight Garza Elementary with the average daily attendance for the four six weeks of 96.32%. This gives us a cumulative average of 91.88% for the four six weeks for the district. And from the beginning of the year to now, we are at 91.25%. Does anyone have any questions? Any questions? Thank you, Ms. Ayala, appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Moving on to item number two under discussion items is discussion of 2023 accountability framework and STAR redesign. Good evening, Mr. Board President, uh, Board of Trustees, Dr. Sainz, Administration, La Jolla SD community. Today we'll be sharing with you the 2022-2023 Accountability Reset Update for District and Campus Accountability. In addition, a portion of tonight's presentation will review the STAR assessments, how the STAR assessments have been redesigned to a more dynamic assessments that aim to assess students in the same manner as they would be provided instruction in the classroom. Texas Education Code Chapter 39.053F allows the Commissioner of Education to establish and modify standards to continuously improve student performance to achieve goals of eliminating achievement gaps based on race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status, and to ensure this state is a national leader in preparing students for post-secondary success. The big question that most folks have is how do we calculate an A versus a B and a C? Under the state accountability system, there are three domains, student achievement, school progress, and closing the gaps. Collectively, the three domains are used to calculate a campus's letter grade and numerical grade. It should be noted that the higher of the three scores earned under student achievement and school progress will represent 70% of the campus's or district's final grade. Under the proposed 2023 reset, the targets and scaling would remain static for a period of five years until the next scheduled accountability reset in the 27-28 school year. For 2023, it is important to note that the accountability ratings for both districts and campuses will be delayed due to the STAR redesign and scaling activities that must occur prior to releasing campuses and accountability ratings. What this means to us is that La Jolla ISD, along with all Texas schools, will not receive their letter grade or their accountability rating until mid to late September of 2023. Domain one, student achievement, focuses on star data. All campus types, however, for high schools, we include graduation rates and CCMR readiness measures. For elementary, middle school campuses, STAR results would represent 100% of the student achievement domain. For high schools and district scores, 40% would be STAR, 40% would be college readiness indicators, and 20% would be graduation rates. STAR component domain one is measured 
by aggregating the performance of all students, all tests at the approaches, meets, and master's level. Those three numbers are then aggregated and divided by three. Based on scaling tools that are provided to us by the Texas Education Agency, we take that raw score and we convert it to a scale score. For middle schools and for elementary, this represents 100% of their domain one score. For high schools, this represents 40% of the domain one score. CCMR. In 2023, there will be no significant changes on how CCMR will be calculated. However, there will be significant changes to the scaling of CCMR. The implications for 2023 CCMR are that industry-based certifications who are scheduled to sunset will be capped at 20% of the, tw of the campus's graduating class. So it is possible that some of our students who earn their CCMR indicator with a sunsetting industry-based certification will not be part of our accountability rating because we're over the 20% gap. The most significant change occurred in the scaling for CCMR. The implications for 2023 CCMR for La Jolla ISD have dramatically changed from what 2022 accountability was. As you can see in this slide, a campus with a CCMR raw score of 66 in 2022 would scale to a 92. But that same raw score in 2023 would scale only to a 71. This would cause dramatic changes in both domain one and domain two for the 2023 accountability cycle. Because the scaling is very different, the state has pushed the finish line further for all campuses and districts in the state. Now, turn your attention to the CCMR cut points. In 2018, 2022, the cut point for an A was a 60. 60% 60 of the annual graduates for each campus had to earn a CCMR indicator. In 2023, in order to earn an A for CCMR, we would have to have at least 88% of our annual graduates earn a, a CCMR indicator. That is a very dramatic difference from one year to the next. And again, the state has pushed the finish line further for La Jolla ISD. Graduation rate component. This represents 20% of the final domain one rating for all high schools. Our graduation rate component is calculated by determining the graduation rate for each high school. That graduation rate is then scaled. The scaling works a little bit different in the graduation rate. Instead of scaling up, this, the system scales a little bit down. In this example, if a campus had a preliminary graduation rate for four years of 88.39, or a five-year graduation rate of 86%, or a six-year graduation rate of 90.1, we would take the higher of the three. In this case, the graduation rate would be 90.1. That would be our highest graduation rate, the six-year rate. That 90.1 would then be scaled to a 65. 25, 20 percent of that 65 is what would be used as our domain one accountability for our high school campuses. So the graduation rate will only affect high school campuses, so comprehensive high schools. The final calculation for domain one for high schools is a little bit trickier than it is for elementary and for middle school. 40% will be calculated from star performance, approaches, meets, and masters. 40% will be calculated from students that earned a CCMR indicator. And 20% comes from the graduation rate. Domain two. Domain two has gone a little bit of changes as well. You could look at how students are growing year over year, or you could look at how similar campuses are performing relative to each other. These two are st strategies being employed in school progress domain, academic growth, and relative performance. The final score and grade for domain two is the best of either academic growth or relative performance. Let's look at how these two components are calculated. Growth measures a student's performance from one year to the next. Have they grown academically from third grade to fourth grade? Have they grown from fourth grade to fifth grade? In some cases, now because of the redesign for STAR, 
we can calculate growth from reading in eighth grade to English one end of course. So now we'll be able to calculate growth. And so students are able to show us that they were able to grow one year's worth of information, one year's worth of knowledge and skill, and they can earn a point for their campus. In addition, in the 2023 accountability reset, the state has introduced bonus points. Bonus points have never been awarded under an accountability system, but for students who failed to meet approaches grade level in 2022, if the campus provides the interventions and they're able to successfully get the student from does not meet approaches to meets approaches grade level, then the campus earns 0.25% of a point. So for every student that they can get, they can grow from one year to the next, they get one point for academic growth, annual growth, and they get one point for accelerated, or I'm sorry, 0.25% of a point for accelerated learning. So here our campuses are able to show the hard work that they're introducing in the classroom and that they're doing before and after school providing tutoring and get students to grow and earn some bonus points. Relative performance, uh, measures a campus, uh, will look at a, how campuses with similar numbers of economically disadvantaged students perform relative to one another, and how far above or below the norm the campus lies. Excuse me. For example, a campus like Dr. Américo Paredes Elementary, who I had the pleasure of sitting down with their administrative staff last week, um, we were able to calculate that for domain one, in order to earn an A, they would need a 90 approaches, a 60% meets, and a 30% masters to obtain a 90. But because they traditionally serve a very high percentage of economically disadvantaged kids under relative performance, they would only need to score an 83% approaches, a 55% meets, and a 30% masters to earn a 91 under domain 2B, relative performance. So it's kind of like the state is giving us a curve because we're working with a very high economically disadvantaged population. And across our district, most of our campuses do uh, serve high populations of economically disadvantaged students. The third domain is the closing the gaps domain. The closing the, the gaps domain is meant to ensure that attention is given to each and every student in our schools. Grades in other domains are based on looking at all students together. This domain looks at students that share similar um, backgrounds. For example, we have an all-student group, a Hispanic group, they share the same uh, race, ethnicity, demographic. Or we have a high-focus group, students that are economically disadvantaged, emergent bilingual, special ed, highly mobile. Those are the three groups that under the new Closing the Gaps domain La Jolla ISD will be accountable for. Under the Closing the Gaps domain, we used to have 13 different indicators. We are now down to three supergroups. These three supergroups is what La Jolla ISD will be held accountable for. However, domain three has gone the biggest change out of the three domains. Domain three has gone from a yes, no, you met or you did not meet the, the target to a zero to four point system where if you're making progress towards the target, you earn a point. If you made significant growth towards a target, you earn two points. If you have met the five-year target that, it, that will be in place from 2023 to 2027, you could earn three points. If you, earn, if you meet the final target of 2038, 15 years from now, you will earn four points. Because of the redesign in this domain and the way that it is being calculated, it's possible that a campus at La Jolla ISD can meet their targets for this reset right now and still not earn an A in domain three. So we could have campuses that are working very hard and earn their three points because they're hitting the interim targets and still not earn an A under domain three. And this is very hard to swallow as an educator because we know the work that's being done in the classrooms. But this is how the system is rolling out from our state. The campus overall letter grade. Once scores are determined, we determine the highest of the three scores under domain one and two, 
and that will represent 70% of the final letter grade. Closing the gaps domain will represent the 30% of the final grade. Both numbers are added and that's how you determine your campus score. The district, however, under 2023 resets will be very different. The, the district will no longer have a standalone accountability system. The district will now be held accountable under proportional ratings, meaning that students who are enrolled in grades three to 12 will represent a significant portion or a percentage for each campus. And each campus type will, will be aggregated together to determine the total weight by elementary, by middle, and by high school. Every campus has already been notified of their weight for the 2023 accountability system, and those numbers will simply be added together to determine the, the district's numerical grade and letter grade for domains one, two, and three. In this slide, you will see how the proportionality weights are uh, distributed amongst our campus types at La Jolla ISD. Elementary will carry 27.19% of the weight. Middle school will carry 29.38% of the weight. And high school will carry 43.43% of the weight. It is safe to say with this slide that how our high schools perform will be a very significant indicator of how our district will perform in the 2023 accountability cycle. And this was based on our enrollment like this previous year? Yes, Dr. Benavides, this is, this is based on snapshot enrollment as of the last Friday in October. And the calculation is very simple. How many students that are enrolled in grades three to 12 divided by the total number enrolled in the district that are in three to 12. Now for high schools, again, it's very different also because not every student tests in high school mm -hmm. because they may have already met their end of course requirement. Right. However, for a high school, all nine through 12 students are part of the denominator. Oh, okay. So they're in total enrollment, yeah. which is why they carry the highest weight. Mm -hmm. This is a, an, this was a release in March of 2023, direct from TEA. I'll, I'll go ahead and read this verbatim. 2023 ratings will be different State law requires updates to standards to continuously improve student performance and ensure Texas is a national leader in preparing students for post-secondary success. Prior to 2017, accountability standards and cut points were raised every year. A through F enables apples to apples comparison by updating standards less frequently. However, this results in larger changes when updates occur. This year is different with the updated standards. Therefore, 2022 and 2023 ratings cannot be compared side by side. It is possible that a campus with an A in 2022 may improve in 2023 and yet receive a B rating. It is possible that a campus can go from a 92 to a 94 under the old system, but under this new system because of the manner in which they're calculating uh, growth and the manner in which they're calculating closing the gaps domain, that campus would still slide down to a B rating. It's very likely that that could happen. So the campus itself did better, but they actually lowered in their letter grade and their numerical grade. Now we're going to switch gears and we're going to talk about the star redesign. So along with having to deal with an accountability reset, our core, core, core content coordinators have had to deal with the redesign of STAR. The redesign of STAR basically includes transitioning to online assessments by the 22-23 school year. We're proud to announce that we accomplished the transition to online testing in 21-22, a full year ahead of schedule. It also includes adding new item types and capping the percentage of multiple choice items. In addition, they eliminated the standalone writing assessments for STAR in grades four and seven. However, the writing has reappeared under the newly designed reading language arts assessment and will now be assessed in grades three to eight and of course English one and English two. Now, what does that mean? That means that instead of just assessing writing in two grade levels, every year our students will receive, will be assessed in writing within the reading language arts test from grades three to eight. So there's a heavy focus in writing across the state 
And again, our core content coordinators have, have adjusted. They, they've trained our teachers, and, and they're working with them to ensure that our kids find success within this new RLA assessment. Part of the 2023 STAR redesign is based on improving alignment to the classroom experience. In effective classrooms, teachers are coherently building students' background, knowledge, and vocabulary in all subject areas. Because they do that in the classroom, the redesign will prioritize cross-curricular passages in RLA that reference topics that students have learned about in other classes. It is very possible that in the RLA assessment, the student can be asked to answer a question on the assassination of Abraham Lincoln within the reading language arts test. So two different subjects basically being assessed on the same assessment. However, they're only going to be looking at the student's skill of writing, not the actual content, like whether they knew or not, whether they knew or not uh, how Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. They were just going to base it on the, the content of writing. Okay, asking students to write about what they, what they read and using evidence from text, which includes in the assessment, writing in all RLA tests, reflecting our updated TEKS and having students write text-based responses. So to kind of give you all a picture of how that's gonna look in the new STAR redesign, here's an example of Algebra 1. In Algebra 1, we used to have 9% of the items be a non-multiple choice type. And there was only one type of item. It was pretty much a fill in the blank type of item. Under the STAR redesign, 33% of the tests will represent non-multiple choice items and there is now nine different types of items that can be assessed or in manners in which they can be assessed. And though now our teachers are having to teach our kids how to work with these items. So the, the test is being redesigned. However, the state says that the test is not more, it's not harder, but the manner in which it's being assessed, it's very different from what our students are used to. So I'm, they're gonna find a little bit of difficulty in being able to adjust to the new assessment. We have done our best to incorporate technology in our classrooms and platforms that allow us to be able to assess our students in the best possible manner throughout the year to include these technology enhanced items. And just to give you all an idea of how the test is changing in grades three to eight, 9%, 8%, 7% of the old test was the non-multiple choice items. That is moving now to 38%, 40%, 35% in some grade level. So a big chunk of the test is, is redesigned and changed for our students. So this is how an item would have been uh, tested in the old system, the item on the left. On the right, the same question, but now the students have to show the equation of how they, they arrive to the answer. So this is an equation type of item. Again, a simple multiple choice item on the left now is embedded with a calculator and students have to answer the, the item very differently by providing the equation or selecting multiple items that could represent the correct answer. So our items in RLA changed a little bit different. So in RLA we would write an, ex an expository composition and again the students would write an essay. Now students have to cite evidence within the passages that they're in their response to be able to get those points. Now, with the new RLA assessments, they've introduced two items, short constructive responses and extended constructive responses. Those responses, those items carry heavier weights than do the non-short constructed and extended constructive responses. And again, here's another example of a simple multiple choice item and how now students have to rewrite the statement or rewrite the response to show that they understand the content. The extended uh, constructed response is the one that they have to write about what they've learned? It's basically like um, having to write their, the short essay. So they, they get, um, I believe it's 2,340 characters. I don't have the paper in front of me, but more or less that they have that many characters that they're able to write. So it's like writing the essay within the reading test. Okay. So it used to be that we would assess reading on one day and then we would assess writing on another day. Right. But now it's all, both of them together within the same day. It's so one, test. one test. One test. Are we projecting longer times during testing? 
I'm sorry, can you repeat the question, sir? Uh, are we projecting longer times during testing since, since they have to do some writing now? Based on our benchmark, Ms. Uresi, we did notice that a lot of our kids, and we did receive a lot of phone calls from our campuses, that students were taking longer to yeah. finish the test. And in some instances, some students were, were unable to finish. Um, so because we, we benchmark or we try to benchmark in the same way that we're going to start tests, we were able to make adjustments. So our coordinators were able to, to meet with the teachers, discuss pacing, especially for the little kids because third and fourth graders are, are very different. They're still getting into the, the swing of things. Uh, they were able to work with the pacing, work with the, with the teachers to maybe not use so many different uh, strategies or more online-based strategies. Um, so yes, we did respond to our data and, and we made uh, adjustments with that. But we do foresee kids taking a little bit longer for testing. However, the state does say that the test has been redesigned so that most students can finish the assessment within two to three hours. Um, however, based on what we've seen, uh, students will be taking a little bit longer this year because again, they've never been assessed like this. It's, it's very different and we have provided local assessments and we've tried to mimic most of our local assessments with the technology enhanced items. Mm -hmm. So I think confident our kids are prepared. It's just they've never gone through the actual STAR assessment like this. Yeah. And the third graders do have short constructed responses also? That is correct, Dr. Benavides. They do have short constructed responses. I believe those are worth about two points, and the extended constructed responses are worth about 10. I'll go ahead and skip over to science. Um, again, a simple multiple choice question, um, and, and this question is probably on the water cycle. Now, instead of just selecting one correct answer, the student can answer the question by directly choosing an area on the, on the image that would uh, indicate whether they understand what is going on within the water cycle. So it's very different. This is not just a simple multiple choice. Now show me what you've learned. Wow. Star released item here. Um, and again, this is a, a simple multiple choice. Now this is what they call a drag and drop. So instead of just choosing one answer that would be the possible correct answer or the sequence, in this instance, the student would have to drag each one of those four items where they correspond within that, that sequence of events. So how would that be graded if they get them all, they have to get all four? So like in some of these items, uh, they, they do provide partial, partial grading. Um, so, so they may get like half the points if they get half the item correct, or if no points if they don't get any of the items correct. Did we have any glitches when we did the benchmarking? Did we have any glitches with the technology? Technology, as no. far as technology goes, no. Um, however, I, I, I do work very closely with Ms. Clem Garza in our technology department. Every time, um, every time the internet goes down or something's happening, I start seeing the phone light up. I, I try and get a hold of either Mr. Mercado or Ms. Garza and say, okay, what's going on? Is, is our technology okay? Most of the time, it's not us. Most of the time, it is our providers. Um, so, but as far as during the actual benchmark, uh, nothing, we, we were very stable. And was anything done uh, differently? Like for example, did certain kids get on at a certain time and other kids at another time or everybody together? Typically, it's by campus, Dr. Benavides. Some campuses may start, you know, 8.15, 8.20, and another but campus may start 8.30. But we do test all kids at the same time. It same was time. not and in intentionally scheduled staggering. We don't stagger them. Uh, we don't stagger them. Um, I've met with Mr. Mercado. I've met with uh, Ms. Garza. They've uh, assured me that our infrastructure is robust and it can handle all of our kids testing at the same time. Um, so. We've had, we haven't had any issues, cross our fingers, because STAR is coming up in a couple of weeks. So yeah. as far as that goes, uh, we also have the technology available to us. Uh, one of the things that uh, I'm very proud to say is that our, our district did go out and purchase touchscreen devices for our students. And one of the features of our online testing platform is that students can use a stylus with their math test. So instead of having the student transfer the item to a piece of paper and work out the problem, they can simply lay their, their Chromebook flat and they can answer the question because we have touchscreen Chrome, Chromebooks for all of our elementary students along with styluses. So, and is there so enough devices question. for every student? I'm sorry? Is there enough devices for every student? Yes, Mr. Lesti. As, as, as far as I know, 
I, again, I've worked with, very closely with the technology department. We ensure that there is a one-to-one -one device for all kids when it comes to testing. Awesome. And the recent uh, rainstorms and all that didn't affect any any of our technology systems or campuses or nobody went down? We weren't testing during the recent rainstorms. Uh, so um, I do know that uh, when we came back, um, I guess our power went out over the weekend during the Easter holiday. Right. So uh, I know my computer and my server were down, but as far as that goes, that, that was it. Mr. Duque, is our, are all our schools then connected via underground or lines, satellite? How is it that we get out to all the schools out in the mile lines? That is a very good question. Um, I believe we have fiber optic because I've heard that uh, some of our campuses, when they're doing work in and around our, our campuses, uh, somebody accidentally cuts our fiber optic lines. Mm -hmm. But um, I, can, I can follow up with, with the technology department and, and find out how we're connected. So but I know that you said that you had already started this last year or in, in a prior year, and you're, you're sounding very confident that we're ready. But I've just kept note of how many things will the students be required to do that they were not required to do before, and then how much more data then would be in the lines. So there's more writing to do, constructed versus non-constructed programs, you know, the multiple versus non-multiple type responses, and there will be more schools so one of the in the strategies system now. So one of the strategies that we employ during testing is um, we shut down our guest networks which allow our kids to latch on to the access points in the classrooms that are not on the guest network. So they're on the La Jolla ISD network. So by shutting down our guest network, we actually increase the, the amount of um, devices that can connect to our access points. And so that helps us there. As far as the items with the students and working with the, with the, with the new item types, we've been working with our, our vendors um, in this particular case, we use DMAC as our district vendor for online testing, and they've incorporated a lot of these new technology enhanced items in their platform. So all of our assessments from the first six weeks, I'm going to correct that. I don't, I need to go back and check, but I can assure you that at least from the second six weeks, we've had all of our technology enhanced items within our assessments for the six weeks. Teachers have also had uh, access to resources such as um, I believe HMH Writable, um, they have, uh, forget what the program is for mathematics, uh, EdSight, Ed uh, and they have the technology enhanced items. So our kids have been exposed to these items. They just never have taken an actual star test with these items, and that's going to come up here in the next couple of weeks. But they we'll, have been exposed. We'll have statewide more schools taking the tests online that we've had before. So yes. we may, we may, ex I'm just pointing out some possible scenarios yes. to where, what if something does occur that our students have a difficulty in completing a test, that just to recommend that you have, I know you we will, do <laughs> provisions. We do have a plan in place, Dr. Samora. Okay. As a matter of fact, one of the things that we decided to do as a district is uh, in order to provide teachers and staff more time uh, to teach our students, we opted to use the second week of state testing, not the first. Most districts and campuses will use the first, if something's going to go wrong with the state vendor, it's going to go wrong in the first week. They'll correct it by the second week. That gives us, us more time to teach and more, more time for our students to learn. That's one. Two, um, we have gotten guidance from TEA in regards to those few students that may not finish uh, because of the new assessment or maybe because they're slow typers. I, I have two daughters that are in fourth grade and I can tell you that they, they don't type very fast, but they know what they want to say. So they may take a little bit longer time. And if that's the case, our testing coordinators have been directed to contact my office for guidance in regards to that. We do have a plan in place for that. That's good. Thank you. And again, um, in this item right here, a, a simple multiple choice item where they would look at a graph and cor uh, find the correct answer will now require two correct answers based on the same question, guys. So this is the same question from a star release test. This is how it can be redesigned to include a technology enhanced item. Social studies, again, uh, this is how the item would be normally tested where the student would uh, select the correct answer or the correct sequence and in the technology enhanced item they would match the table grid. I'm going to go ahead and skip this one. I'm going to go to the, the other item. And this is one of my favorite items. 
Uh, in this item, the student is described, is asked to answer the question, how did Brown versus Board of Education decision influence the civil rights movement? And they would just select a correct answer, a simple multiple choice question. In the redesign, they would have to write out the statement of how that actually impacted. So now our kids would have to show that, that they were taught that, that, that court case and that they understand the implications of that court case and then they would have to describe it in writing. So again, here, we're not looking at the writing, we're looking at the content. They would have to show mastery of the content. Wow, that's, that's, that's a hard one. <laughs> I'll go ahead and uh, ask if there's any questions now. Mr. Duque, on the graduation rate component on domain one, what strategies are we implementing in the district uh, to ensure that the graduation rates increase? Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, I'll defer. I believe our, our director for uh, dropout prevention is here. Mr. Luna. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Kandu. Thank you for that question. So um, the graduation rate, what we've been doing to increase it, some of the lever points that we, we found, and I know Dr. Zamora had alluded to it in a previous board meeting, was our ninth graders and, and the promoting power from ninth grade to, to 12th grade. So we're working with departments like CNI and coming together and discussing our students uh, earlier than, than 12th grade so that we, we can uh, be proactive and uh, increase that graduation rate. Um, the other things that we're doing is because the graduation rate also includes the dropouts, um, not only if the students that dropped out this year, but in the last four years, whether it be 9, 10, 11th, or 12th grade, we're actually tracking them da um, daily in the evenings and in the weekends as well. Uh, so for example, historically in the past, we were probably at 240 uh, levers. Mm -hmm. We're currently at 93. And so doing that is going to help increase the graduation rate also, having more students continue with us. Uh, we also have an early warning system, which is a strong dropout prevention um, strategy that we're doing. Uh, we currently incorporated it this year and working in conjunction with CNI, uh, we're tracking students as early as the elementary level, uh, focusing on attendance, behavior, and course failure. So those three things are strong indicators of a student dropping out and continuing into their, their graduation in, in the cohort in 12th grade. Um, some other things that we're doing is um, we're tracking the cohort. We're also tracking the cohort. Um, we're looking at daily usage of their of how they're obtaining their credit through the software that we use is Edgenuity. Um, students that are not on there, uh, specifically the cohort seniors, uh, our graduation specialists that they specifically work with our seniors are calling in students, and then they're also calling in parents as well and letting them know, you know, your student didn't do so much of the uh, ingenuity um, to get their credit. Uh, we're also tracking students that need to stay for remediation for uh, EOCs. Um, if they're not staying for tutoring, we're also calling home, letting parents know, you know, your son or, or your daughter did not stay and, and we need them to stay, um, they're close to graduating. So we're doing that as well. We'll be doing that with the other cohorts as well, going into 9th, 10th, and 11th grade. We're working on automating the system to where we are tracking not only the, the seniors, but we'll also be tracking 9th, 10th, and 11th as well, so that we can get them at an early age. So uh, I'm very happy with what we're doing. Uh, I think um, this year, more than ever, we're working uh, together with the different departments, and so we're sharing information, and I think that's been a big plus for us as well. And at the recommendation of uh, Dr. Science, we also did visit um, other districts to see what high leverage um, strategies that they're doing. And those two things that came back were working uh, together with departments and um, hitting the, the students earlier in ninth grade. So those are two things that we're currently working on. Our student services department staff also meets with our principals every six weeks and they review their failure reports by teachers and then uh, principals in turn need to meet with the teachers that have high numbers of failures and teachers need to do plans on how they're going to improve their failure uh, percent. Thank you Dr. Science. Yes. We're also tracking the, the um, 
sixth grade to 12th grade, actually, the failure report by, by demographics as well. So we're looking at every population. And we're also doing the, uh, the truancy mediation hearings uh, before we send to court. We want to hear why the student is not coming and how we can help. A perfect example is one student, um, she was not coming because she did not want to go to dance class. And uh, the campus was able to drop that dance class and give her a, an additional math class. Shortly after, she, she started attending and her scores even went up in all of her courses. So just looking at every student individually and what is it that they need uh, and preventing a dropout and giving them the success early on in ninth grade and even in the middle schools, we're gonna see that graduation rate increase. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So does, uh, does the do the high schools work with CCC in terms of getting the five-year and six-year graduation rate? Thank you, Doctor. Doc, you. Uh, yes, Doctor Samora. We we currently have our graduation specialists, which are uh, the ones that work with cohort students. They go um, weekly. They started going once a week, but now they're going two to three times a, a week. We also have the truancy officers going as well because they need uh, assistance in getting our students in. A lot of times, you know, our students are, are working um, and so they find it difficult to come and so we have those truancy officers as additional support to go and meet them at, at the home and even at work and, and see how we can help them that way. Uh, again, we're also automating not only the, the cohorts from nine through 12, but we're automating to where we're, we'll be able to track our fifth year and sixth year students as well because we understand that that is part of our, our accountability system. And those students, when they stay in school for their fifth and sixth year, are they at their respective comprehensive high schools or are they going to CCC? So they, they will go to CCC. Yes, Dr. Samora. So then in the accountability system, when you said that either the, the best of the three, the four-year graduation or the four-year graduation, fifth or sixth year, is that what comes into play here, what happens at CCC, or what happens yes. at the high schools? Absolutely, Dr. Samora. So the way it works is CCC is, is not actually their own entity. So every student is scheduled to their entity. So we could have a student at Palm View High School, but is serviced at CCC. So that student's graduation record would impact Palm View's graduation rate. So, and, and that's by design. That's by design so that the campus, the comprehensive high schools uh, can still maintain the accountability and still be able to benefit from that. So that does impact our five and six year graduation rate. And typically for La Jolla ISD under domain one, we would use the five year graduation rate. That's usually the higher of the three. Thank you. Thank you. If there's yeah. no more other questions, we can move on to uh, discussion item number three, discussion of teachers, incentive allotment, uh, local designation system. Good evening, Board of Trustees, uh, La Jolla ISD community. This evening I'll be reviewing, reviewing the teacher incentive allotment. I know that this was one of the requests uh, from the board members, so we'll go ahead and get started. We'll go ahead and get started and just to uh, discuss the purpose of the teacher incentive allotment. As you can see right here, it's uh, basically to recruit, retain, and reward our staff. If we look at this slide right here, I do want to talk about where do we stand here at La Jolla ISD in regards to the teacher incentive allotment. We do have a cohort A, and under cohort A, as you can see, we do have four campuses, which is Juarez Lincoln, Palm View High School, and Richards Middle School, and Chapa Elementary. And I do want to state that this they're in the fifth year of implementation of the teacher incentive allotment. At the end of this year, what will happen is they'll go ahead and uh, be included in cohort C, which with the rest of the district. Do know that we applied back in August of the uh, August 21st, 2020, and uh, that was the application. It was approved for the whole entire district. And now I do want to state that due to the T-test waiver, we went ahead and went into a cohort D, and that was uh, back on January 29th of 2020. 
Now, do know that this year, on October 20th of 2022, um, we did do a data submission. And um, I do want to state that we did have uh, 1,549 teachers that were eligible. And out of those 1,549 teachers, we did have 446 teachers that decided to go ahead and pay the $500. That way their data could be reviewed. In February of this year, we did receive notice from uh, Texas Tech that our data did not get approved. And because of that, do know that as a district, we started to be very proactive. Even before that, we started to be very pro proactive. We did have a committee uh, established already, and what we decided to do is to add to that committee and start working with the committee by building some background knowledge, which actually is the committee that we recognize this evening. And today, what I want to do is just go over what we've done with the committee. What you see here in this particular slide is the different meetings that we've held with the committee and the different topics that we've covered. As you can see right here, back in November 17th, you have the different topics that we discussed. It was understanding the TIA goals, uh, identifying the different key components, learning best practices, and just going, just doing an overview of the student growth measure. On January 31st, what we did was we talked a little bit about the teacher observation and the calibration, which is very important when it comes to TIA. Also, we talked about the spending plan in our application, and we also talked about the TIA calculator. On February 28th, what we did was, at that point in time, we had already received our data validation report. So what we did is we went over the data validation report with our committee, uh, talked about the feedback that we had gotten, and looked at our application and decided, do we need to make some adjustments? We also looked at the Region 1 comparison uh, results and looked at which other district got, a, uh, got their data validated and uh, talked about maybe we need to make some changes, right? And then we decided whether we wanted to do an expansion or modification to our application. On March 31st, what we discussed was we talked about um, the decisions that, the recommendations that the committee had given us and the work that the TIA subcommittee uh, had done. Did the teachers get any feedback or it just wasn't looked at? The teachers as far as the- The ones that submitted their, their information. So uh, as far as uh, feedback, they did not get individual feedback. No, they did not. We did get a report which was reviewed with the committee as far as these are the, we have five domains that, that are reviewed and then under the five domains we have 11 indicators. So that in itself, we did review it with the committee members, we did review it with the principals and then they turned it around at the campus level. So is that gonna help them when they like resubmit data? Absolutely. So that's based on that report, we went ahead and discussed do we want to do an expansion or modification to our application, and that way whenever we do uh, our submission again, it should help us get approved. So that's what we're going to review right now based on the, rep the data that, I mean, the feedback that we got, what were the recommendations from our TIA committee. So on this uh, slide, what you see right here is, based on the feedback from our data validation report, as um, the committee made the following recommendations. They recommended for us to submit a letter of intent for an expansion, in our case, a modification to our application, to include only star teacher assignments, to use a pretest uh, or a pretest posted uh, post assessment, which would focus just on the student growth, and not to do any optional measures. The reason behind not to include any optional measures is because when they do the calculation, the optional measures are not calculated at all. Okay. How does that impact a non-star teacher? Basically, we would not be submitting, they would not be included in the teacher incentive allotment at all. At all. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about the teacher assignments. 
The TIA task force recommended that the La Jolla ISD TIA designated system would only designate teachers that teach A star EOC tested subject, subjects. Teachers that teach multiple sections would have to be evaluated on an EOC course. Okay. Now, which subjects we would be looking at? They're listed here. Now, one of, the, one of the grade levels that is not listed here would be third grade. That's one that we can include, and the committee did decide to include third grade. So let's talk a little bit about subcommittees. So we do have several subcommittees, which are the planning and learning subcommittee, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, what work that they do based on the recommendations from the TIA committee. And the subcommittee for planning and learning is composed of just CNI. That's the you know executive directors from CNI and our assistant superintendent for curriculum and instruction. So our TIA committee, based on the data that we received, based on the learning that we got from um, you, you know based on all the learning that we got on the teacher incentive allotment, this is the feedback that we gave our subcommittees. In order to obtain reliability and behavior, behavior must be observed several times. So one of the things that they recommended was, we want to make sure that in, when it comes to, to our t-test, we're not just observed once. We want to be able to observe more than once and for it to be rated and counted. So they said it could be three times, it could be five times, we just want to be observed more than once. So this is the recommendation. For TIA teachers, in addition to the 45 minute counted formal observation, evaluators will also conduct two additional counted 20 minute observations. These evaluations will only focus on domains two and three, which if you uh, recall under T-test, domain two is instruction, and then domain three is your environment, your learning environment. The T-test calendar will reflect the observation windows as follows. As you can see right there in the fall, it will be from September to October, and that one would be a one count to 20 minute observation, and in the fall, it would be from November to December, and that's when we would do the formal observation. And then in the spring, we would do February through March, and that would be another 20 minute observation. And the appraisal will follow the T-test pre and post timeline. So in, we would make sure that we're meeting with the teacher before and then after to give them their feedback. Appraisals will also follow the T-test pre and post timeline. And then, so that's basically the observation piece. Now one of the things that we also talked about was we wanted to make sure that we were aligned with the TIA regulations. So looking at the levels, we went ahead and said we want to make sure that we go back to the recognized level being at 3.7 average in domain two and three, and the 3.9 average for exemplary, and then the 4.5 average for the master's level. So that was something that we also agreed that we needed to make sure that we uh, made that correction there. So the two additional observations that they wanted were the two, the 20 minute, one in the fall and one in the spring. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Dr. Villarreal, to, uh, can you bring that slide back, please? To, uh, you say it, to obtain reliability, behaviors must be observed several times. Is that by one observer or by multiple observers? That, that's gonna be up to it, whoever their appraiser is. So it would be that one observer. Mm -hmm. And reliability would be determined how then? So when we submit our data, one of the things that they do, uh, uh, Dr. Zamora, is they do what you call that calibration. They, they look at, if we're saying that it's a master teacher or it's a um, recognized teacher, what they do is they look at the, are we calibrated across the board when we're looking at ratings amongst the, your administrative team, right? Even though, so it, it, they look at, are we calibrated across the board when we're looking at ratings between um, 
not only within your team, but also within the ratings, all, all the, everybody that's been designated and data that we submitted. So they'll look at that, right? And then they'll also look at within the grade level, within the, uh, the campus as a whole, and then they'll go from campus to campus within the district, and then they'll go from, uh, you know, district to other districts based on the ratings in itself. So I'm not sure if I'm explaining myself correctly to you, but that's how they do the reliability and uh, validity when it comes to calibration and in reference to that. I, mm -hmm. I also want to add that every six weeks, the curriculum and instruction department do check for calibration among different administrators and mm -hmm. among different teachers, and they provide the actual average uh, for the walkthroughs that administrators are doing, and we kind of compare from school to school what the average teacher score is, and we have the teams at the campuses make sure that they are calibrated. In other words, that one um, administrator is not rating teachers higher than others for the same level mm -hmm. of performance. Mm -hmm. And I think that's my concern, you know, that do we have like different appraisers observe the same setting and then see how it is that their scores are, how those yes. compare, mm -hmm. so that the reliability then would be measured in that manner. Yes. And, or determined, uh, rather. Yeah, curriculum mm -hmm. and instruction has spent a lot of time on training with administrators to make sure that they're calibrated, they're, that they have, that they're looking at the same things and that they are rating the same perform like performance with the same level uh, in the T-test instrument. And, and on that same slide, and I was gonna ask one prior to, so uh -huh. I'll connect them now. Yes. It says for TIA teachers, and earlier you said who were the ones that would be TIA teachers, and that I thought I heard you say that that would be for the teachers that teach the start tested that grades. And what happens to the other teachers? So the other teachers continue to be, obviously they have a formal as well, right? And they But are they eligible for TIA funds? They're not eligible uh, for TIA funds for this, for the, for this year, right? Because I would for, expect that we would have alternate measures right. that can be applied mm -hmm. so that all teachers are eligible for TIA. Yes, and, and that's conversations that we did have, uh, Dr. Zamora, and there were very intense conversations that we had with the whole committee. Because in the committee, as you saw, there's representation from the high schools, from the early college high schools. So they were very intense, very, um, because our current application does, is one that's very, it's inclusive of all. Um, and when we were reviewing and learning about TIA, we, one of the things that we understood was we did need to make <coughs> modifications to it right now to be able to get an application that we felt would be a build that strong foundation to where eventually we would be able to bring, we would build that strong foundation, be able to get one that would be in, uh, Approved, get our data approved, and then be able to build it to where we would be able to now be able to expand. Because right now we're doing a modification to our, uh, our application, and then we would be able to expand to be able to make it inclusive. Well, so that is our goal as a committee. I would say that you make it a priority goal. Yes, no, absolutely. And that's something that as a committee, we're working towards. I think that one of the things as we were reviewing, um, as we were learning, and then as we were reviewing the feedback that we received, it's something that we felt, okay, yes, we need to modify, and then we need to expand. We're totally in agreement. So in that mm -hmm. committee, do you have teachers who do not teach in those grade yeah. levels or that are not in the tested areas? We do have, we have representation from fine arts. We have representation from high school teachers. We have representation from the early college high schools. We, we absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, but now we're gonna go ahead and move on to the next slide, which is the growth measure. Um, in order to receive valid and reliable data to evaluate student growth, the committee recommended that we use the state assessment 
Um, and again, one of the things that we talked about was we currently have the SLOs and we spoke about removing our SLO from our application and focus on our STAR assessment and do the pre and the post. And we would measure third through eighth grade and EOC participating students that did not participate in the state assessment system the previous year will take a pretest in September. And then the second bullet reads, previous year's data will be used for those students that participated in the state assessment system the previous year. So basically what it's stating here is that we would be giving our students a pre and a post assess a pretest, and then which would be a star release assessment, and the post test would be the star assessment in itself. Basically, in a nutshell, that's what it states there. Okay? And then to be designated, uh, our teachers must achieve the following growth measure. Recognize for it to be an 80% of students uh, that would meet the expected growth measure, exemplary an 85%, and then masters a 90%. This here too led to a lot of, uh, you know, intense conversation amongst our committee because, um, again, it was about the, how high those percentages were, right? So we did have conversations about this, but at the end, the consensus was, at least when we, we went around, you know, we grouped them, and the majority of our committee was, were in consensus that 80% or higher, and we were, I mean, we were good with that, those percentages. And then one of the things that our planning and learning committee did was they looked at, as well, at where are we at right now currently with our growth measures, our academic growth scores right now, are, we're already in the 80, 80, 81, 80, 82, as you can see right here, right? So we do have data to be able to state or back up the, our decision in itself. So does the district or the campuses determine the growth measures? So what happened here with the growth, growth measure is that we, as a committee, we went ahead and discussed, okay, where do we want to, you know, uh, set our growth measure, right? And then we made the recommendation to our planning and learning committee. They went ahead and discussed it. They came back and said, okay, this is where we want to, uh, you know, this is what our recommendation as well. We discussed it with the TIA committee. We had another intense conversation about it because we, we did have two uh, teams that were saying those were too high and then uh, brought it back to the planning and learning committee and then they went ahead and gave us their input as to why they went ahead and dis you know gave us those those recommendations which was our data shows that it was at 80 percent or higher at this point in time for the district so originally it started with the teacher group with that oh committee, yes with, with the committee. committee yes mm -hmm. So going now into our uh, administration and finance, which is now our, our budget committee. Initially with our current application, because again, we're about to submit our application to be modified, but with our budget component of our application, it's a very strong, uh, you know, strong component as of right now. So we're really not doing anything uh, to it at this point in time. Right now we have that 90-10, 90% uh, 90 of it is being used to fund our teacher compensation and, you know, part of, from the 90% we are paying the TRS portion of our teachers, it's coming out of that 90% and the 10% is being set aside to be able to pay any additional costs that, uh, that we might, you know, occur based on you know, things that we might need, for, for example, uh, professional development, any resources that we might need for our teachers, uh, any resources that a campuses might need to implement TIA. Uh, I should have asked this yes. before you got into this, but I'm just curious, mm -hmm. uh, did um, leaving out the CTE teachers, is that gonna impact, because you know how they have to be pushing for CCMR and you need them and they're not included in this in this group, right? Or did I get it wrong? They're not included in this group. They're not, right? They're not included in this Have group. Have you had any any, any feedback from, from... No, we have not, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Benavides. No, we have not. 
but that's a conversation that we could go ahead and we haven't submitted our application yet. We'll go over the timeline right now in a bit, but uh, we could still continue to have uh, conversations with the CNI and the committee, if need be. Only because they're going to be so critical when it comes to the CCMR uh, contributions and um, if, if they're not part of it, what well, they're going to feel like, mm -hmm. why do it? One of the recommendations from the uh, committee uh, was even though, you know, if, if a teacher certified to teach, for example, uh, a star, star tested course, that, you know, the high school principals can go ahead and allow them to teach at least one section, that way they could qualify. So that is in, you know, a conversation that we could go ahead and have with our high school principals, but that would be up to the discretion of our principals to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Just so long as you discuss it, because, I mean, all teachers are valuable and all mm -hmm. teachers are important, but looking at that new redesign that we mm -hmm. just saw and the importance of those mm -hmm. specific areas, I think that somehow they need to be embedded into TIA. Yes, absolutely. We'll go ahead and have those conversations with uh, uh, CNI and then with our committee as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So looking at the timeline, as you can see right here, um, for the expansion and modification timeline, the application is due to uh, TEA by April 17th, which it's just around the corner. We've already finished doing the, our application or modifying our application, We're getting ready to submit it. Um, approval of the changes will, will we should be receiving word back in uh, I mean August of next year or this coming August, and then we would be able to capture data uh, from the expan expansion and modification system 2324. So next year it would be we would be working on just you know gathering data, and then we would submit data and uh, new designations on October 20. 24, and then we will come before you letting you know that we got an approval for our designation. Mm -hmm. Do you get to uh, amend uh, the application once it's submitted or you don't get to amend? What do you mean by that? Like, like in other words, There's correction. you had an idea of a group that you wanted to include, bless you, and would, do you get to amend it or no? Once it's submitted, that's it. Once we submit this one, as of right now, that's it, it? it. Yeah, that's uh -huh. it. Okay. So your timeline's real short because Monday is the seventeenth. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. and, and again, we've been we've been working, we've been dialoguing, and and so forth. We've been going back and forth with our our committee. As you can see, there's been a lot of work that we've done with our TIA committee. Um, and like I said, I mean, they've been very vocal. They've been very diligent. They've been showing up to those committees meetings and um, there's, there has been a lot of learning, a lot of learning uh, that's, that's been occurring. Well, I don't blame them. I commend their participation because mm -hmm. right now teachers are working really, really hard and, yes. and they need to be heard. So thank you for, for listening to them and getting their input. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, if you all don't have any questions, oh, one more thing. One of the things that the committee had requested was for us to go ahead and um, and oh, do a add all our resources to our district webpage, which we did. I do want to thank our PR department because they helped us out with this. So now, if you go into our district webpage, you're able to see the teacher incentive allotment. So you could go here and you're able to see teacher incentive allotment webpage and you're able to go here. Our, the teacher incentive allotment guidebook is up. You're able to click there. You're also able to uh, see the list of committee members. You're able to also go in here and click on this link and you're able to see all our different agendas. You're able to go and click here. You're able to see the national board certified information, um, FAQs, and there's questions here, questions and answers. There's just a, all the resources that, that our staff might need. Okay? That's good, because that was one of the things that they felt, that was one of the things that they felt that they 
wanted things communicated. So that's an excellent idea. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Villarreal. Mm -hmm. There's no other questions. We're going to move on to item number nine, consent agenda. As per uh, board uh, member request, we're pulling out uh, for discussion item number seven and eight under bids. No. Under business and finance. I mean, I'm sorry, business and finance. Business and finance item number seven and eight. Okay. With that being said, I need a motion to approve. So move. I have a motion by Mr. Esti. Second. A second by Ms. Oli. So those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 I was opposed. Motion carries. Uh, we're going to item number, no, you know what, we're going to discuss item number seven uh, for approval of standard form of agreement between owner and contractor for La Jolla uh, ISD HVAC improvements, Jimmy Carter Early College. Okay, let okay, yeah. Let me do. I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. Let's go to uh, item number ten under contracts. I, ha I need a motion to approve item number one: discussion and possible action on whether to give notice of termination contract to current Lincoln Texas Collection Firm. I would need a motion. Motion for no action. Second. I have a motion for no action, and I have a second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 There's three ayes. Uh, all those opposed say nay. 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 I have four nays. Item dies. I need a motion to approve. I need to make comments. I then. need a motion to approve. I'm and calling for a vote. Prior okay. to a vote, I want to I'll, I'll also move uh, as written under uh, item. I have a mo I have motion myself. I need a second. I have a second by Ms. Oli. So those in favor, say no. I say nay. I have a discussion. No. I have a discussion. I need and, uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. You can vote aye. Aye. before all the discussion. That oppose, you aye. cannot vote aye. before discussion. Okay. Can I can I finish? I called for a vote. There's four votes. Now I can open up for discussion. Okay. Let me ask who initiated this item. Who initiated the item to be placed on this agenda? I'm looking for. A, the one on possible election to terminate the contract. Or any recriminations that uh, were given? Who I recommended for Dr. this item to, I, I, to me, be put in the agenda? Continue. Dr. Sainz, you have your name here as initiated. Mr. President, this item. although you can have a motion and discussion, discussion can be used to interrogate the board. If you want any information regarding the agenda item, they can get the information from the agenda packet. But the discussion period is not really a period to discuss to interrogate the board. Okay. Well, the motion and, and, was and made, I and I asked for discussion. I want to make something clear. We get this agenda uh, on Friday. If there's any questions that we need to do, we can call our superintendent or we can call the staff and 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 question that. But if it's information that needs to be out to the community, I understand the question. This here. purpose of this meeting is to discuss the agenda items and I vote have, on. I have. I have. I'm going to call for. I have four four uh, four yeses. Uh, all those opposed say nay. 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 I have three nays. Motion passes. Item number two, discussion and possible action on approval of written findings for delinquent tax attorneys, delinquent tax attorneys. I move that no action. Resolution, resolution 2023-02, uh, uh, text tax code section 33.11 and resolution 2023-04, text tax code section 33.07. 0 .07. Uh, section 33.08. I need a motion. Do you proceed due to procedures not being followed for this item? I am moving that no action be taken. I'm, I'll I'm second a, that. I have two. What, what are you motioning? I am saying that due to procedures not being followed on this particular oh, item, nor the previous one. You know what? Okay, that's it's fine. But that, I'm going to call for be a no vote. Action. I'm, I'm calling for a vote. Your vote but is no action? For, for purposes of the minutes, Mr. President, can we get the motion? Because we're going to have to write the minutes down. So we need his motion on the minutes. I am saying here that I am questioning the procedures used to place this item on the agenda. And that due to I me not thinking right now. So what is your motion? That no action be taken. OK, I have a motion. And then not approved. OK, not approved. I, have, I need a second. I second. So I have two nays. All those in favor signify by saying aye. We, we have had both parties here all, this all, evening. All those say nay? Nay. 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 nay? nay. nay. I have four nays. Okay, then I, I so move to approve I item number two. I have a motion by myself. I, I, want I need to a second. A, I want to call for I order here. here. I need a second. I have a second. All those in favor signify by I want to call for order aye. here. Aye. All those opposed? 
you're, you're, I'm also opposed. No opposed. Which one are you no voting on? No. Number two. Which one? Are you? Number two. I have four yeses and nobody's. Uh, nay. Nay. Okay, I have one, nay. two. Dr. We're Lee, voting nay. Mary and Dr. Mora voting nay. nay. Mr. Anthony Uresti, myself, uh, Esmer, and Dr. Cantu voted yay. Motion passes. So, Ligo, may I, Motion passes may I say next. something about these items? I, I don't control the meetings, Dr. Samora. Dr. Uh, well, you have to, I will kindly, kindly ask you to respect. I'm running the meeting. Just and I kindly ask you to respect your members. I kindly ask you to respect your members. Passed. Okay. So now we're moving I on. I will be questioning this item going forward. You Both of them. Over. Uh, business and finance, uh, we pulled out items seven and eight. So we're going to discuss item number seven, approval of standard form of agreement between owner and contractor for La Jolla ISD, ESSER HVAC improvements, Jimmy Carter Early College High School projects, Ethos Engineering. You need a motion to discuss? I need a motion. So moved. I have a motion by Mr. Desti, and a second, second by Dr. Navides, open for discussion. Second by Oh, second by Ms. Solis, I'm sorry, I thought I, thought I heard Dr. Navides. I was gonna motion, but he beat me to it, okay. that's okay. So I have Mr. Desti and Ms. Solis, so then yeah. open no it up for discussion. Any questions that the board might have? That's on 245. 245, item seven. I find it unusual that you do ask for a discussion here, but you didn't allow for it before, sir. I, I kind of no, you didn't. Me. You didn't. You didn't allow this for is discussion. This not the time to talk like that. Well, it was not the time for you well, to I'm do what you did. Meeting, okay? So sure. That's okay. We'll, we'll remember that. Item number seven, so let's move forward. Any questions by the board? Mr. Villarreal, uh, just a quick question ha on this one. Um, we went out for bids on this project early on in the year, or when was this? Uh, for bids, it was earlier this year. Uh, I want to say uh, it was it was in March. We what? went out for bids in March. Uh, we brought it to the board at the last board meeting. The last uh, March. The March? best. No, this this March. Oh, this March. Okay. Okay. I didn't see that. Uh, we brought it to the board for for. Uh, Consideration, the ranking, and the highest ranked bidder. And so this is the uh, negotiations. This is the second part. This is the, the best and final offer? This is the best and final offer, yes. Okay. No other questions, do So now we have a motion, a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Item number eight, approval of standard form agreement between owner and contractor for La Jolla ISDH, ESSER HVAC improvement. Performing Art Center Project Ethos Engineering. So move. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Desi, a second by Dr. Benavides. Anybody had a question? Uh, same. We are going to have to bid on this one. And then I noticed that there is an alternate number one. That, that, what is that option? Yeah, so the alternate uh, for this project, we are replacing uh, the chillers. Um, so there's, I want to say, like four units, four or five units that are. Uh, we're not going to be part, or we're not part of the uh, chiller replacement mm -hmm. um, prior uh, in, in a prior project. So they are DX units. So we want to convert those DX. Uh, it's I think it's a total of five units: rooftops and air handlers. Uh, that we're going to convert them to chillers, uh, chill water systems. So the base bid was uh, replace chillers and boilers, and the alternate was to convert some of the uh, uh, air handlers and rooftop units to chill water systems. So that's additional to the base bid, right? That, I mean, our initial bid was going to be a million dollars and then... It's, it was an alternate that we considered um, we, when we received the bids. We considered uh, this alternate um, and it was, uh, it was proposed that we, uh, as a committee, that we go with the uh, alternate on this, on this project. Okay, so it's only 480. For the alternate, yes. Okay. We, we had already done some improvements to these cheaters at the, at the finals, right? Um, yes, we did, um, I believe, one of the chillers. So this is to replace the rest and then some of those air handlers that we didn't do in that previous project. Okay. 
Any questions? I have a motion, a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Item number nine, approval to accept donation for General Electric uh, through South Texas College STC. I need a motion. I, uh, I'm sorry, motion. I have a motion by Mr. Desti. Second. Second by Dr. Kandu. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion uh, excuse carries. Excuse me, uh, Mr. President. Going back to the, the item, uh, the possible action or whether to give notice to terminate. I, I know, I just need for, for the record, are we going to give notice or? Yes, it was approved. Like that. How was it approved? Let me, let me direct that question to legal. Okay, yeah, I just need to know, just for the record, if we're going to terminate or are we giving a notice? Can we go back? Yes, it's to give notice. We're not even allowed to okay. discuss it. Right now. But we don't know how much, I mean, like, is it a 30 day or a 60 day notice or? Well, that's, that's the thing. There's it says 60 day or on your packet. 60 days, okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. So item number 13, approval of submission to PY24 Victim Assistance, General Victim Assistance Direct Service Program, VOCA Grant Application Resolution number 2023-02 to assist La Jolla ISD Police, Police Department in providing services and assistance directly to victims of crime. So moved. I have a motion by Dr. Cantu, I need a second. A second. Second by Ms. Solis, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. Item number 14, approval of 2023 school, pro, uh, school programs with revisions. I need a motion to approve. So moved. I have a motion by Ms. Solis, I need a second. Second. Se second by Dr. Cantu. What are, what are the revisions? The they're, on, they're, on the they're the funding. Just the funding? Was the funding yes. Then that's okay. That we had to correct yes. for I, had, I had asked that question, so that's okay. Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Under later E, there's no, re there's no items under human resources, so at this time, we're going into executive session at 8.31 under section code 551.074, 551.072, and 551.071. It is now 9.51, we're out of executive session. Uh, let's go down the line under H, under personnel. I need a motion to approve uh, employment of, profession, uh, of professional and personnel. So move. I have a motion, any second? Second. Second, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, motion carries. Number two, employment of classified staff, paraprofessional and auxiliary personnel. I need a motion to approve. So move. I have a motion by Dr. Cantu, I need a second. Second. Second by Mr. Desti, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, motion carries. And item number three, staff resignations, professional personnel, paraprofessional personnel, and auxiliary personnel. So moved. I have a motion by uh, Dr. Benavides, I need a second. 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 A second by Mr. Desti, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, aye. motion carries. Item number four, approval of the 2023 school, uh, summer school personnel. So moved. I have a motion by uh, Dr. Benavides, I need a second. I'll second. Second by Ms. Hernandez, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, aye. motion carries. Uh, item number five, discussion and possible action on acceptance of superintendent's retirement. I need a motion to approve. So moved. I have a motion by Mr. Desti, I need a second. Second. A second by Dr. Cantu, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, motion carries. Item number six, discussion and possible action on appointment of interim superintendent. We would need a motion. So, so move. Uh, you wanna get? Name the person. I have, I don't, whose full name was? Beto Gonzalez, as I, interim superintendent. I have a motion to appoint uh, as an interim superintendent, Beto Gonzalez. I need a second. Second by Ms. Solis, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Nay. I have one. No. I have Nay. two. And I have Ms. Hernandez, Mr. Zamora, and uh, Dr. Benavides. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, motion carries. Discussion and possible action regarding general litigation and pending legal items. Mr. President, members of the board, I recommend that we settle C-2312-181. 
La Jolla Independent School District versus Peterson Construction. That's a property damage lawsuit. Do I need a motion to approve? I have a motion by Ms. Oliso. I'll second. A second. And a second by Ms. Hernandez. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries an action regarding purchase. We don't have an item. Uh, no action on that. There's item no action eight. for item number eight. I need a motion to adjourn. So move. I have a motion by Dr. Benavides. I need a second. Second. A second by Dr. Cantu. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. It is now 954. Meeting is adjourned.